Sacred attention therapy is an approach to liberation. The first liberation is from the conditioned self. Psychology of early life. The second liberation is from the realization of the true nature. The fulfillment of oneself as a personality. And the third liberation is the liberation into the life of spirituality and spiritual practice. Sacred Attention Therapy, or SAT, is a meta-psychology because it embraces not only the physical, emotional, mental and energetic aspects of the human being, but also the spiritual and the transcendental. Therefore, it is uniquely placed to be an applied psychology through counselling and psychotherapy. In the 21st century, in which human beings are more complex than ever before. Welcome to the first in a series of interviews with Richard Harvey, psychospiritual psychotherapist and spiritual teacher, to discuss the Turnian talks. My name is Rob Meager. I'm an interfaith minister. I lead a spiritual ministry initiative in Ottawa, Canada called Spiritual Guidance, and I've been a student of Richard Harvey's work since 2012. Today's interview will discuss the Turnian Talks as a whole. It's a three-part lecture series, and each subsequent interview in this interview series will explore in more detail each one of the lectures in the Turnian Talks. The Turnian Talk manuscripts are contained in an ebook entitled Bodhi Ocean, which is available through the Sacred Attention Therapy website books page at www.sacredattentiontherapy.com forward slash books. Bodhi Ocean is one of a trilogy of three ebooks, each containing 14 lectures, totaling 42 lectures. The first ebook is entitled Moksha Dawn, the second is entitled Dharma Sky. And the third ebook is entitled Bodhi Ocean. Again, all ebooks are available through the books page at the Sacred Attention Therapy website. You can also listen to the full recording of all of these lectures in the series on the lectures page at the Sacred Attention Therapy website. And lastly, you can view many other interviews on the videos page or on our YouTube channel. Again, the URL for our website is www.sacredattentiontherapy.com and on our website you can click on the YouTube channel icon to view the interviews and the videos on our YouTube channel. I'd now like to provide a little bit of background about Richard Harvey. He's a psychospiritual psychotherapist and spiritual teacher. His work emerged out of the human potential movement of the 1970s. He trained with many teachers in humanistic and transpersonal approaches. He's the founder of Sacred Attention Therapy, a radical new approach to inner work for the 21st century that proposes a three-stage model of human awakening. Richard is the author of Your Essential Self and Flight of Consciousness, among many other publications. He works with people all around the world, and his forthcoming book is entitled Your Sacred Calling. And it's now my pleasure to welcome to the interview Richard Harvey. Howdy. Good to, good to be with you. I'm with you. And we start today talking about the Turnian Talks, a, a beautiful trilogy of lectures. And as I have in the past with with other lectures and when we get together to talk about 
the introduction and leading into the lectures and, and the lecture series as a whole. I, I want to ask with this lecture series, where did you receive your inspiration for the Turnian talks? I received the, the inspiration as usual from I don't know where or from a divine source, but um, it seemed to me that the numbers of these lectures were very, very important and um, the number sequencing of these lectures. And so this three, um, not to labor the number uh, sequence, but three was really important. Turnian means three. Mm -hmm. um, it's not merely arbitrary, I think. Um, it is uh, the three fields of self, mm. other, and the divine, and there was this wonderful, and it emerged for me too, um, uh, sentence really, which is the three titles, um, if I recall correctly, to be born a human being. That's the first one, yeah. Um, remind me the second one. Who needs a guru? Who needs a guru? Who needs a guru? Yeah. To be born a human being, who needs a guru to realize consciousness? Definitely. These are the three titles. But in fact, they allude to the three fields which are the totality, uh, self, other, and God. Mm -hmm. And they have this one lo rather lovely sequence of, of being a sentence. And I think that I mentioned at some point in the lecture that I record, and this was only after uh, the first lecture, I think, that um, there was a poem uh, called that, that um, I'd written some year year or two before, to be born a human being. So, mm -hmm. so somehow that all uh, meshed in. Mm. Now you've already mentioned the three titles. I'll, I'll, um, I'll call them out again in their full titles because <coughs> most of them had subtitles. So the first one was yeah. being born a human being, an invitation to live in the divine mystery. The second lecture in the series is Who Needs a Guru? The Discovery of the Divine in Your Life. And then the third of the three is entitled To Realize Consciousness Merging with the Divine. What would you like to tell us about each of each of those lectures, Richard? What would you like to share? Perhaps we could focus on the second one because I'm noticing and perhaps it's a theme I remember in the flight of consciousness in the introduction, which that book was trying to make sense of spiritual paths for people and trying to find some commonality in experience, belief and faith, various faith. Um, and I remember pointing out or saying something I think is still true, that in spite of the welter of Eastern techniques, philosophies and religions which have come to the West, we in our Western mindset still have tremendous difficulty with the idea of a guru, the idea of a spiritual teacher, which of course um, in India or uh, other oriental countries in Japan and so on, they don't because it's part of their culture. So, you know, we have the idea of the priest or, you know, the fellow in the church we talk to or who marries us or baptizes us and this, that and the other, but he's not necessarily wise or um, spiritual as such, of course. Um, but this idea that you can somehow go straight from self to divinity is, I think, self-evidently flawed. I think we can see it, and you see that the things that appear in your individual life, and this is surely the theme of the second of the Turnian talks, who needs a guru? It's an intentional question, because many people would say, I don't, you know, who does? I, I don't, what are they for? You know. Um, is, as I recall, we talked about many different spiritual masters over the last, well, over time. And um, the idea here was to really point out that, you see, the things that appear in your life really radiate from the inner world. I mean, if you are really concerned about money or materialism or something, well, you know, likely as not money or cars or houses or 
stuff will appear in your life and and your you know your life will be rich with those things if you're inside of your craving simplicity as i tend to do then the life is fairly simple you you birth that in your life so to say if you are intent on the spiritual path as many people are finding out today you can't do it on your own it's just too complex and if you're intent on it then you will manifest a wise mentor a spiritual guide a spiritual teacher not another worded guru and that person who symbolizes the truth and the divine in your life is an absolute necessity for anyone who's intent on the on their spiritual path and i'm unrelenting about this and i'm uncompromising about this as I, as i know you know but this um, and and it came up many times through the uh, multiple series of lectures um to the degree that i think somebody made an interesting remark to me once they came back and said they thought they'd already heard this one and it these are some other talks and this was me um carrying on with my theme about you know you must have a spiritual teacher and the spiritual teacher is this guy you know or, the, or this woman this is what it, the spiritual teacher is not a personality it's not a human being this is the thing we have to get um it's not some personality you become dependent on it's not many things and i think in these talks we probably covered it fairly comprehensively but in this center talk of the turnian series who needs a guru i think uh, finally hopefully perhaps we bring the point home that if you're serious you're going to have to have that element in your life one of the things i find interesting about this discussion about who needs a guru and and as as you shared this uncompromising um uh, a point about that um it does come up in previous lectures it does come up in previous interviews um that people may have watched but you've also talked about the parallel um or the relationship between a spiritual need, teacher needs to be a psychotherapist and a psychotherapist needs to be a spiritual teacher and my observation um has been that um certainly in the west people are very very reticent to um to want to engage in psychotherapy want to engage in spiritual teaching they're just it it does not seem to be um ingrained in the culture if, if anything it's the opposite it's something you know it's a sign of weakness um to to seek out and begin to work with a spiritual teacher or a psychotherapist so i just it's um as as you have pointed out in some cultures it it's part of uh the culture whereas i find in the west my experience has very much been um uh the label of therapist or or psychotherapist which is even a stronger push away from is just not part of the culture again it's one of these things we lost to primitive cultures you read maladoma uh, somae's books he was a scholar an african medicine man and he can very uh, clearly state the case for the wonderful wisdom and uh, guidance offered to children in african uh, tribal society you know we've lost that kind of thing and we've lost uh, the shamanistic mentality we've lost the uh, the invisible world really in the sophistication of 20th century materialism commercialism and propaganda of course and all the, all this kind of thing 20th century has a you know represents our mindset now and our self consciousness um but um I think psychotherapy and to to a great degree spirituality and certainly gurus after the 20th century have a very bad press but of course some of that's for very good reasons um but it doesn't mean that the basic principles behind it aren't absolutely uh, crucial to survival of the human race i mean it's it's been said so often it's clichéd it's hackneyed really I mean, from john lennon to uh, krishna murti and on and on and on down through the ages it's the liberation of one single human being that's what we should be aiming for it's a humble aim in a way but it's a great aim 
And that's why we can be empowered uh, rather than disempowered in our inner world and rather than look outward to all of the extrapolation of inner dis-ease and think, what on earth can I do, you know, about World Bank, political situations, possibility of World War Three? you turn in and you say, well, this is what I can do. Not, not to remain in, not to take the mystic stance, but to turn in and to cleanse is enormously um, effective, even on the world stage. I mean, that's a long discussion, but, but it's true. It's absolutely true. So therapy by whatever name, or inner work as I'm leaning to try and call it to make it a little more neutral, and psycho-spirituality, again, by whatever name, is absolutely critical today in a um, in these, should we say, dangerous times. Earlier lecture series, Richard, my perception anyway is that they've tended to focus on matters that resonate um, and or emanate from the first stage of your three-stage model of human awakening. That is the journey of self-discovery. But I. I have a feeling with this lecture series, the Turnian Talks, as if it touches more on the second and the third stages of awakening in the model. I think, yeah. Is this the case? You know, and if so, um, was that intentional? Yeah, no, I think it is the case, and I think that uh, what I tend to do when I'm receiving inspiration for book writing or, or talks is to, there's a part of me that wants to reach further and talk about spirituality. And at the same time, I'm aware that I don't want it misinterpreted through a psychological focus, because another uncompromising point I've been making over and over and over and over and over again is that psychology isn't spirituality, spirituality isn't psychology. And But what I mean by that is, even in the Gospels, life of Buddha, um, blah, 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 um, all of the um, largely um, spiritual autobiographies are concerned about um, psychology, personal psychology, these are inevitably the hoops to go through the hurdles to, to leap over. And um, it's a case of moving the self away. Now, I think we're involved in an evolution spiritually. I think, we're, I think we should expect a lot more from ourselves at, the, at this point. I mean, we could be justified in, in expecting a lot less given the state of the world, but I think we should be thinking in terms of expecting a lot more. And the fact is, when you're immersed in the spiritual life and unhampered by, for example, the childhood ego, there's an awful lot of work to do in deepening into devotion, into wisdom, and into the life of service, purely without your own personality and character being in the way. Now, if the only thing you're ever doing is pushing and pulling with your personality and your character in so-called life of service or deepening in uh, wisdom, the, the wisdom of Gnani, or devotion, Shakti, and so, so forth, these intense yogas, these true yogas, then you're really not really quite there. You're always kind of a dweller on the doorstep, you see. You're not quite in. You're, you're a foot in, a foot out, and you can't really be a foot in, a foot out. So the spiritual life is magnificent enough that uh, you would seriously want to dispense with the anachronisms of childhood survival, which has created an ego defense system that not only keeps you away from life through suffering, unnecessary suffering in many cases, but certainly prohibits your spiritual development. Mm -hmm. Like many of the other lectures and series, um, you don't hold back, <laughs> <laughs> and you've alluded to this earlier in this interview, and, and for some, perhaps many, it could feel like they're being hit over the head with a mallet or a plank. <laughs> Um, now you don't mince words, you don't sugarcoat matters of the divine, you don't give the seeker an out. Yet, if anyone ever had or has the chance to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, knows you have a very gentle approach, 
in one-on-one. -on -one. Um, is there a parallel between your gentle in-person approach and your lectures? Well, I mean, one of the things I've really liked and I've really liked about practitioners over the, you know, the endless years I've been involved with it is I always like to hear about a practitioner where I hear about at least two different personalities, if not four or five. I've written about this here and there with a woman called Pat Dencham. You know, every, every time people came to me about it, they said she's like this, like that. I thought, I'm going to have to see this woman because nobody's describing the same person. These are just so many facets. Mm -hmm. And I think that I that hopefully I have that too. Um, when you say I'm gentle and all, and this is your experience. Thank you, and I hope that may be a mainstay of work. Was very important. But conversely, I I was recalling the other day just shouting and screaming at somebody who came to see me for um, uh, for to work with me. And so there is a time for challenge, there is a time for asserting, there is a time for uh, aggression when it's justified and it's purposeful and it's, if you will, needed. Um, and there is, um, in my view, in what I do, no place for my personal character and personality other than to reflect different facets of what's needed in the moment. For, for a given person. As far as, you know, being assertive in the lectures go, I think towards the end of the, the series, some part of me sometimes felt like I was championing or being a mouthpiece for the divine. And I think that um, whilst the divine stands out of space and time, there's also a need to, say, stand up for yourself in a way. Because, you know, God is perhaps more ignored today than ever, which is extraordinary. Hmm. Really, and um, but and in the most uh, pervading uh, uh, ways, you know, the most um, manipulative and strange ways, of course, you know, because to be misrepresented, misunderstood, interpreted to, through partisan religions, and represented in conflict is just—it's inexcusable, really, from the point of view of the divine. Hmm. So, there is a part of me that's quite. Um, um, angry about that. Has this, um, I'll call it authentic approach, always been with you? Or, or has chronological age and psychological maturation brought it more to the fore? Well, I don't think that um, I ever was so uh, grounded and solid in my um, awakening, you know, as I think I've been making clear or did later in, in the lectures, I don't have an awakening as such. You know, people look for an awakening or seek to improve on their awakening or whatever. For me, uh, my feeling is that I was, I was already in a state of awakening and then I struggled to make sense of it. And certainly for 25 years, I made no sense of it whatsoever. There was absolutely <clears throat> no reference points in my life whatsoever. Music was the closest thing. There was, there was just nothing. I mean, I was reaching for everything. And I was just not in a place where anything was available until I was in my uh, early to mid-twenties there. And um, suddenly I found all these people who were like alien life forms, really. I'd never seen people like that. And of course, they knew what I was talking about, but I could hardly talk about it. And I was, whoa, you know, you know, they could talk about it much better than me, that's for sure. And um, it was really in the last, uh, 10, 12, 15 years that I finally, um, what do you say, you know, grounded in the spiritual so that I became prepared really for the first time not to think um, before speaking and not to, um, not to have a, as you say, an individual investment in it in some way, that there was somebody there who had to interpret or something like this. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to write. I don't know what the lectures are going to turn into. Mm. 
Thus, they're divine. Otherwise, they would be just my thoughts, my opinions. I know this is difficult for people, and some people say, yeah, 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 but it's just what you, just your view, you know, and all this. And I say, I'm not remotely interested in my view. I'm, I'm, I'm really not. It's not my view. It's whatever, it just comes. So that took a bit of grounding in, and I would say that I was um, getting up, you know, 49, 50 before that very solidly was in place. There's um, a wonderful teaching, you know, of it, um, A Course in Miracles, and it talks about um, the characteristics of the teachers of God, and the, and the first one is trust. <laughs> um, and it's upon which trust is, a, is the characteristic of the trait upon which all the other nine, you know, are built upon. And, and this is in part what I'm hearing you share is that trust, that grounding. Um, Absolutely. It took me a long time to trust, and it takes people a long time to trust life even. It's painful. It's painful to see for me when I see someone with a spiritual destiny, because I do see it now. Mm. And, um, and I'm able to say, look, I, you know, really, it's real. You've got this spiritual destiny, and guess what? There's a struggle now. You'll be struggling for two years, three years. You know, I can see it. And they go, oh, no, no, I want to make it easier. I mean, can it be easier? I say, oh, you know, what, if I could wave a magic wand, you know. And then there's, you know, one or two people I've had recently who've just come and they, that's it. You know, there's no struggle. There's no work. E even the psychological work is, you know, after the mm, surrender. Mm -hmm. Seri seriously. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are so incredibly diverse. It's still wonderful, isn't it? You know, just the diversity and variety of people. And just to know that someone can come to you who is, so to say, seeking, or mm -hmm. they don't know that they're not seeking, and so therefore they're ready. And <laughs> they're just like uh, fruit falling off the tree and just go, oh, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. And then there's others hanging on for dear life, you see. Yeah. Um, when we come together the next time, we'll, we'll launch into um, the first of the lectures in this series, Being Born a Human Being, an Invitation to Live in the Divine Mystery, and we'll, um, we'll take that time to dive into that lecture, and I look forward to it, Richard. Thank you. Me too. Until then. Thank you, Robert. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.